Welcome, John. Thank you, James. Good to be here. Well, thank you for coming on this uh, Easter weekend, and it is yeah. uh, uh, a very uh, special time. And uh, um, John, could you tell us a little bit about uh, Easter from uh, the Edgar Casey uh, perspective, the resurrection, and uh, a little bit about yeah. that? Yes. Um, basically, it is a spring uh, ritual of rebirth from the uh, cold uh, darkness of winter, finally yielding its position, and there's a certain death to the uh, egocentric self, to the little self, the earthy self, and a birthing of the deeper soul self and spiritual levels of awareness. So it's a special weekend, uh, both for nature and for the symbolism the of soul awakening. growth. And it's uh, it's very uh, very close in a in a uh, in a sense to the uh, to the March equinox, which uh, yeah. is a very very powerful date as well. And yeah. uh, John, you've uh, you've written a new book that I'd like to uh, speak uh, a little about, and let me. Uh, mentioned that uh, to our listeners that John is just a prolific author and he's an amazing uh, carrier of wisdom and uh, he's probably embarrassed as I say this but I'm one of John's biggest fans I think he is an absolutely amazing soul and uh, he is probably or at least in my opinion the uh, one of the world's greatest authorities on the Edgar Casey readings John how many books have you have you written or co-written? Well, it's over 20, but once it got over 20, I stopped counting. And, uh... <laughs> over 20 books. And so your newest yeah. book is about a topic that uh, uh, I think is of great interest to uh, a lot of people, and uh, it's entitled 2038. Can you speak a little bit about 2038? Yes, James. Uh, actually, my latest book, which is coming out in May, is Edgar Casey on the Spiritual Forces Within Us. But the recent book that you're referring to is 2038 Great Pyramid Timeline Prophecy. And it's all about the discoveries in the 17 and 1800s of a internal calendar or chronogram inside the Great Pyramid in Giza, Egypt. And uh, many of these uh, archaeologists, anthropologists, and just spiritual searchers wrote a lot about this uh, back in that period, but it was poo-pooed later as archaeology and m much of the world's thinking became much more materialistic and earthy and not so interested in the esoteric. But inside that Great Pyramid, amazingly when I first saw this I was stunned is a chronogram of our descent as the morning stars in the book of Job out of heaven into earth and a long journey through the earth cycles back up into the heavens ultimately and that big transition takes a major step in the year 2038 Edgar Casey said that the prophecy inside the Great Pyramid at ends in 2038. It took us from the beginning all the way to 2038. Isn't that amazing that we're approaching a date like that? And in, in a real sense, it seems to me like 2038 is sort of the next 2012 in a way, that it's the big, big date that's going to uh, bring some sort of uh, major shift and uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people woke up on uh, December 22nd, 2012, and said, what was the big deal? And so what what I feel happened on 2012 was that the planet expanded. And I've spoken about this at the, in fact, I was at the ARE two weeks ago and spoke a little bit about uh, what I call the Aquarian shift. And I uh, think that it is the uh, solar radiation uh, among other factors that has uh, changed uh, the pattern of the earth. And uh, uh, didn't Edgar Casey John, speak about a, a new body type that would emerge uh, in, uh, in, this, yes. uh, in this millennium? Yes, exactly. All of his uh, prophecies about this time 
are gradual, but he has them as physical, mental, and spiritual. And so he actually talks about our bodies are in an evolutionary process of moving into what he named the fifth root race body type, a new prototype with 12 chakras and other elements in the body that would allow the soul to be more conscious and at a higher vibrational level than the previous uh, body types that we've been using. That's that's fascinating. And, um, you know, Carl Sagan, who was the, uh, uh, the famous astrophysicist uh, that wrote the book Cosmos, uh, and he was uh, a really brilliant man, and he said about uh, 30 years ago that the only possible switch that the uh, human physical body could make from its current carbon base would be to silicon. Mm -hmm. And silicon is uh, the only other element that has four valence. In other words, it's capable of uh, multiple molecular combinations, just as is carbon. And the interesting thing about silicon is that uh, uh, quartz is uh, silicon dioxide, so it is uh, it is the base element of uh, of the crystal. And so uh, <laughs> I feel that uh, if we make a, a shift into a lighter body, it, uh, that would uh, certainly be a viable candidate, and, uh, and interestingly uh, have a crystalline aspect to it. Right, and so remember Casey said that the uh, Lantean crystal was used uh, in many ways, but one of the ways was uh, cosmic communication to other dimensions, so we'll all be little crystals. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, John, uh, I, uh, I was born and grew up and attended university in uh, Arkansas, which uh, is the largest singular deposit of quartz crystal on the planet. My dad was uh, <laughs> an avid fisherman, and we used to go fish at this uh, wonderful crystal clear lake called Lake Washita in Arkansas at this particular point called Crystal Springs. And that strata of quartz crystal in Arkansas hits the surface right around Hot Springs. So wow. while he would fish uh, during the summer times, I would dive for crystals, and I could fill a coffee can <laughs> with crystals in that water in 10, 15 minutes. And so we'd have about 15 of those to carry home, but uh, usually oh, I would only allow great. one. But it's, it's an, amazing, uh, an amazing place. And then right after uh, I finished school, I, I moved to uh, Brazil and began work as a geologist, and that's the other area of the enormous quartz crystals in uh, in in the world, and so uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, studying these rocks and these crystals, and it makes more sense to me now. But uh, you know, there's a, there's a really special aspect about crystals, and uh, it was about 30 years ago that people started sort of becoming more aware of their special properties. And you referenced that Casey said that uh, people uh, used the uh, the big crystals to communicate with uh, infinity and had uh, uh, out of, but there's actually one uh, channel or one reading of Casey's where he speaks about them being out of body as it were. And so it's uh, yeah. really interesting that we're coming into a crystalline age and that uh, uh, we may possibly be shifting into crystalline biology. Isn't it appropriate that you were born on the largest deposit of crystals and that you worked in the second largest deposit of crystals on the planet? And, and, and I loved my time in, 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 in Brazil, and, you know, I've never lived, uh, my family is still in Arkansas, but I've never lived there since, uh, since I left for Brazil. I, from Brazil, I went to uh, Africa and then to the, into India and, and Middle East and Russia and ended up back in uh, in texas but uh but i have a great love of brazil and a great love of uh arkansas and i really feel that both of those areas were atlantean uh colonies that uh, yeah. uh, there's some places in arkansas that are just mystical and yeah. certain mountain places and you know what's interesting about arkansas john uh, is that it's not only that massive deposit of quartz crystals, there is a very rare 
geological site there near an area called Magnet, Magnet Cove. And it's very near Hot Springs. And it's one of the most uh, interesting deposits of magnetic lodestone on the planet. Uh, it encompasses this circle. And uh, wow. radios don't work there. And uh, <laughs> it's interesting that uh, in that particular area, um, we would, uh, you know, it was just a, a place that felt like a portal. It was, uh, when yeah. you get that magnetic energy around that yep. field of the crystal, something happens that seems to open up uh, the portals in the space time. And, and so there's some amazing places in that area. But I think that that combination of magnets and crystals is, uh, is capable of opening up uh, uh, our pineal gland in a unique way. And so that's, uh -huh. that's very interesting stuff, yeah. Have you, yeah. you you spoke at our 1212 uh, event in Arkansas, was it, John? Wasn't that a great conference? That, the energy was so high, and all the people, the souls there, were just little crystals themselves. It was, and you know, we had uh, Danny Duke there, who is uh, one of the major organizers of the Tucson Mineral Show, and he just filled that uh, hall up with these incredible crystals. He had, I think, a 400-pound quartz crystal on the stage that was really clear and really amazing, and uh, yeah. it really was appropriate for that return of the Law of One event that we had there, but it was a great, great lineup of speakers, and it was my first time to meet you, and I felt like I'd known you for many lifetimes, and I'm really grateful for that special event. And yeah, for, yeah. And for getting uh, connected with you, and uh, uh, so on, uh, in Arizona, uh, John, you're going to speak um, uh, a little bit about the origin of uh, mankind, uh, the original yes, entries uh -huh. of our soul, uh, according to the Casey readings. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a wonder what uh, Edgar Casey was able to channel about the uh, pre-Earth lifetime that our souls all lived in the other dimensions, how we were conceived, how we've gone about our celestial travels, and then ultimately we're attracted to this terrestrial realm for various uh, learning and opportunity and descended through layers, very similar to the Mayan legend of there were several creations and, until it got uh, ideal for us to use this realm. This is a very tricky realm for a celestial um, infinite mind to manifest in a contained physical body. Uh, and so there are many transitions we went through, and Edgar maps them so well, and he maps the levels of our mind so well. And eventually, once he gets us into the earth and incarnating, he goes through the past lives um, just beautifully, giving us great detail uh, around the planet, all the cultures. Uh, uh, just uh, it's amazing story to hear, to watch. I um, I remember when I was in my 20s and first read it. I I was a little out there for the next two years. My mind was just floating for about two years because I suddenly left the idea of being a physical being. Uh, with a personality that was trying to develop into becoming aware that I actually had been alive a lot longer than this life, and I was a celestial being with a mind able to connect to the infinite. And boy, uh, the journey, uh, let's see now, 40-some year journey after that has been wonderful. It's made my life so much better knowing this stuff. And when I meet other people, I see them differently than we would normally see them. Wow. Uh, John, you and I spoke uh, about this uh, once before, and uh, and this is, to me, a, a really interesting point, and, uh, and it brings questions to uh, in my mind sometimes about the uh, sequence of our lifetimes. Uh, Edgar Casey very openly spoke and channeled about a lifetime he had just before, uh, in terms of linear time, Edgar Casey, in which his name was, I believe, Bainbridge. Is that correct? 
Yes, in fact, he actually had two incarnations as Bainbridge. Uh, one was uh, in the Jamestown, Virginia uh, colony area, and then uh, into North Carolina with the uh, the Lost Colony in North Carolina. Then he reincarnated rather quickly in um, Dearborn, Ohio, in a frontier setting. And both of these were very uh, low-level, egocentric uh, incarnations. Uh, Hinduism teaches that we often have a cycle that's uh, very much into the earthy ego material, and then we can actually come out of it and have a very high spiritual cycle. In fact, uh, Hindus' uh, calendar right now shows us in this dark period, and it's going to be followed by a great luminous period of spiritual awakening. Well, that's what happened to Edgar Soule. He had two very uh, self-centered, self-gratifying, self-seeking incarnations, um, and then he reincarnated as Edgar Cayce and devoted his life to channeling this wisdom and helping people with their bodies, minds, and souls. And you know, there's a there's a, a theory in uh, in quantum physics and in metaphysics that uh, um, uh, once we get into a really higher realm, then then uh, there is an inverse that is referred to as the torus, <laughs> in which yeah. uh, in which time uh no longer exist and space moves in other words where we are now time uh time flows and space is fixed whereas on the other side it would be that space is moving and time is fixed and which would indicate that in a in a certain sense all lifetimes are simultaneous and so i've often yeah. pondered the thought that i wanted to ask you about and that is if perhaps um when we choose lifetimes, uh, and I know Edgar Casey spoke about we pre-plan our lifetimes, actually select the astrological patterns that would best allow us to fit our goals. But I'm wondering sometimes if perhaps uh, a quote-unquote beginning soul might choose one lifetime that is, say, in the 1800s, and then another one uh, which might be in spiritual development actually after that one uh, in an earlier lifetime. So I wondered, just from a philosophical sense, if in a spiritual way the Bainbridge incarnations uh, for Casey were at an earlier stage of his, of his soul development, perhaps even bef before uh, his incarnations as uh, Rata in Egypt and uh, Pythagoras in Greece. Yeah. Do you think that might be a, an interesting it's possibility? A, it's so difficult to attach timeline uh, mentality to a celestial being because our highest level of soul, our oversoul, really uh, exists all the time in only one time and in one infinite space. So it's not really experiencing this sequential reality that we walk through it's right. like a bird high above the river of a physical incarnation that sees the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey but it also sees way beyond and it can go way to the future and then turn right around and go way to the past because they're all one at that yeah. level of perception That's your uh, your scientific explanation there just a few minutes ago was outstanding that's exactly uh helpful to the mind, a three-dimensional mind, to comprehend that, then they can understand better how they can have a level of themselves that is beyond time and space. Uh, and this, uh, the outer self, though, does need the focus because it's a very purposeful incarnation. It's intentional. The soul wants to do well. But yet, if you can expand your mind beyond it, then the little challenges of this life, the frustrations, uh, the disappointments, the broken hearts are, are not so heavy on you, and you don't give in or, or fall so quickly because you have a sense of the bigger picture and the bigger destiny. John, I, uh, I recall uh, an Edgar Casey reading uh, and I think it may have been one of the first ones that uh, brought him into the uh, 
teaching of reincarnation where someone asked him uh, what, uh, and you'll know this better than I, uh, what was the true purpose of astrology? Was there any veracity to it? And his response was that we choose the astrological pattern that best allows us to accomplish our goals. And can you share a little bit about uh, Edgar Cayce's teachings yeah. on astrology? Yeah, sure. Uh, the thing for Edgar Cayce is that you and I must understand we are celestial. So even when our terrestrial body ceases to function and we leave, there's a transitional period in which we go into a more celestial body. And um, during that time, we're not idle. The old rest in peace idea is not correct because there's no peace. The soul is still very busy. <laughs> And he said the soul actually sojourns in the dimensions uh, surrounding the three-dimensional planets that we see and that classical astrology related to the three-dimensional planets is actually the educational realm that that planet's associated with in fourth, fifth dimensions. So like you and I would say that Mercury is of the mind, well, if a soul needs to work more on mental development after it finishes an incarnation here or prior to having one, it would go to the realms of Mercury and there it would experience the training and development of the mind to Venus, love, arts, music, Jupiter, high-mindedness, large groups, high ideals, high purposes. He said Saturn is where all inadequate flesh goes to be redone which is not exactly a vacation spot, <clears throat> but in one reading to a lady, he said, oh, here's a soul who's gone to Saturn often, and God loves one who's willing to start over. Yikes. <laughs> uh, so, so Saturn is a cleansing place in the fourth, fifth dimensions. And, of course, just like classical astrology, uh, all the planets that we understand their profile have this energetic educational dynamic. So when you incarnate, you incarnate, Edgar said, it's not so much the position of the planets that dictate your situation and your dynamic, it's that you knew those planets and they were in the position you left to come here. Wow. And they, they reflect what your soul has recently experienced also, if, if you look towards the horizon, they reflect what your soul is longing to pull off or achieve in this realm. Uh, so he was uh, very dynamic about astrology and its involvement in our lives and how helpful it would be to understand it. Well, you know, the, the Edgar Casey material is really prolific, and a lot of people, you know, are aware of Edgar for his um, medical readings, which were astounding and well ahead of their times. But yeah. the information that he provides about what we do in between lifetimes um, and uh, our the laws of uh, grace, the laws of karma, spiritual development, life purpose, is really uh, incredibly important. And so, uh, John, how can people get more involved with the uh, Association of Research and enlightenment. and enlightenment. Yeah, we have so much going on. If you go to the uh, edgarcasey.org, O-R-G for nonprofit organization, edgarcasey.org, you will just see, I think uh, we're up somewhere around 35,000 pages on that website. Wow. And you will see that we have online courses. Uh, we have conferences. We actually come to towns all around the country. I travel all the time trying to come to a place near people and put on seminars, workshops, retreats. We, we also have all these books, hundreds of books, and videos. Um, so there's just a wealth of material. There's also a lot of free information. And members of ARE get a regular uh, magazine called Venture Inward and a newsletter uh, alternating with the magazine, uh, packed with uh, ancient mysteries, personal spirituality, and holistic health ideas. So there's just a, a ton of material, and, and well, you know, I have he was, a bunch of... Yeah, go ahead. I, I had the honor, you know, I, I was with you two weeks ago in Virginia Beach, and I had the honor, yeah. uh, we had the honor of uh, uh, having dinner with you and Charles Thomas Casey, who is, the Edgar, uh, who is Edgar's grandson. 
And one thing that strikes me about the ARE is that the people are down to earth. You, these are <laughs> metaphysical masters, but they're but they're grounded and 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 they're they're not judgmental. It's uh, uh, you know, and one of the things about Casey is that uh, he. He spoke about the importance of being able to relate to people. Sometimes I think in metaphysics uh, we get so lofty that uh, we lose contact with that grounding aspect. Our feet float up off the ground and we right. become uh, a little bit eccentric and perhaps unable to relate to uh, the masses. And uh, But Edgar was a, uh, a very rounded person. And uh, did someone tell yeah. me that one of his sons never really realized <laughs> who his father was because they were just regular people and uh, that's right yeah you see the, in the Casey material the concept of balance was critical training you had to keep your feet on the ground even though your mind was reaching up into the heavens yeah. you had to be practical and because this was a purposeful life to one of the very spiritual ladies getting a reading from him who was just growing uh, leaps and bounds at one moment she came to get a, another follow-up reading from him and he stopped her during the session and said you know it's time to put the red dress on and go dancing <laughs> he, he just wanted balance she she was getting way too far out and uh and so he was like that uh fascinating it, stuff and that's amazing it, it helped you know, me he, a great deal yeah it's just you know that down-to-earth aspect and that's really yeah. important now, just to switch back for a second, uh, John, about astrology, uh, uh -huh. we uh, we are in a very, very interesting time. We have uh, coming up next week uh, a Cardinal Grand Cross that uh, mm. is very, very unusual. It's creating a, a stir in astrological circles. Uh, it uh, is um, a very rare occurrence and, uh, and involves... Uh, uh, four of the of the uh, cardinal planets, and uh, and so you know we had I think it was uh, on April fifteenth a uh, full moon lunar eclipse, uh, mm -hmm. you know four days ago, and uh, on the twenty ninth of this month after this uh, cardinal grand cross we have a uh, solar eclipse followed. Uh, followed by the Aquiad's meteor showers. And so I think all of these are really a, a very uh, powerful time. And uh, I think that as Casey mentioned, and as, uh, as Metatron mentions, that uh, very often it is the astrological coding uh, that puts in a gravity wave that allows us certain opportunities to grow. And I think that we're in a really powerful time uh, between April, May, and June of this year to really uh, self-review, to recalibrate, and uh, and that this uh, is playing a key role in the uh, changing of the Earth. It leads, I think all roads now lead to uh, 2038, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of really uh, powerful things happening. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Casey spoke a lot about the, the law of ones of Atlantis, uh, of Atlantis sort of being here to... Uh, bring in this uh, this new phase and yeah. uh, you speak uh, John a lot about uh, the Egyptian mysticism and uh, at the beginning we were talking about uh, inside the uh, king's chamber that there actually being uh, uh, an interpretation of uh, uh, of what is inside the king's chamber that maps 2038 and so yeah. Uh, was Casey saying there that uh, 2038 is the end of that particular calendar, maybe perhaps indicating that that is a new phase? How, how yeah, would you the, interpret that? Yeah, he, um, in in his uh, recent 100-year period prophecies, he said 1938 was an influx of a lot of enlightened souls to teach and then in 1958 began the test of humanity, the Cold War and um, the, the general movement towards a global understanding of us as one human family rather than nationalities and races and all. And in 1998, the changes were to begin. In 2012, you saw the, the breakthrough out of a long cycle uh, 
a very long cycle that the Mayans had tracked, and be- all the movement is heading towards 2038. Again, it's going to be gradual, not one day you're going to wake up and the whole planet's changed. Right. But we are changing internally, and the planet is changing, and this is a gradual process that's going to lead us to a higher level of life, less uh, of an involvement of physical death. Uh, if you remember, the Hopi have a legend that there was a time when we didn't die, we came and went as we pleased. You know, if you wanted to yes. manifest here, you did. If you wanted to leave, you did. Well, we're now subject to physical death. We can't sustain the life force in a physical body, but we are gradually going to regain that and be able to sustain it, but we're also going to be conscious of other realms and our involvement there. So it's going to be a a major shift. Nostradamus actually wrote a letter to his son, Cesar, that he sees into the future, into the 3000 AD. So um, we have a lot more to go, and these celestial signs are indicating that we are in the transition Things are happening. Be up and doing and getting yourself ready. You know, so many people uh, around 2012 that I would meet at conferences would say that they felt like uh, they were in their last lifetime, and and I mm-hmm. would say, well, I, you know, I think we've I think we've got a lot more work to do, and that, uh, <laughs> I said I think that uh, no question you're you're a master soul, but I think that we need your help a little bit more because if we look around the world now. And this was a lot of the reason that people thought that uh, an ascension did not occur in 2012. And Mm -hmm. so uh, I don't think an ascension of humanity in mass has occurred. I think that's uh, going to happen after 2038, probably a century or two after that. But I think Uh what did happen in 2012 was that the planet shifted into greater dimensionality. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the solar radiation. And by the way, uh, you know, anyone that would like to subscribe to NASA Science News, they have a free email service that notifies you of astrological events anywhere from Mm -hmm. anything from solstices to eclipses. Uh, They don't get into astrology. uh, It's more uh, astronomy. But uh, I got a notice this morning of uh, three solar flares that uh, will be hitting the Earth in the next uh, few days. And, you know, wow. when these happen, these just bring mm-hmm. in a tremendous amount of uh, <laughs> anionic charge. And, yeah. uh, and scientific tests have shown mm-hmm. that uh, when the background ratio uh, that we have on the planet shifts from... Uh, six to one or more anionic or negative to cationic or positive uh, that people have, and this has been scientifically tested, uh, and in their in their vernacular, they said that people have hallucinations. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what I think is occurring there, because that uh, this was brought out in a book by Dr. Bernice Barlow, and uh, uh, she's more on the metaphysical side, and she had done some studies of places um, uh, like uh, Boynton Canyon in um, Sedona and uh, and other spots around the west that were considered uh, the San Francisco peaks near Flagstaff, and mm-hmm. the anionic to cationic ratio there was 6 to 1, whereas normally it's like 3 to 5, and, mm. um, and that's a big change. Uh, and so a lot of these places that, that the compestral societies, that the indigenous peoples, not just in North America, all over the world, had a greater connection to nature, and they knew that certain places they were able to, quote-unquote, communicate with great spirit or to have visions, mm-hmm. and so these were questing places. And yeah. uh, Sedona is one of these, and uh, and so the tests, that uh, were performed were that people would have out-of-body experiences when ionic generators were used to create that six to one or greater ratio. And so these solar flares that have been hitting the planet since 1989 are shifting the uh, ionic ratio. NASA has slides on their website that shows jet streams of, uh, of ionic plasma 
circulating the planet, and they seem to sort of gather around places that we think of as sacred sites. So that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, part of uh, the science that's coming into yeah. this. And, uh, yeah, a that's lot of the great thing you bring to this, James. That's the great thing you bring to this, and that's a marvelous uh, insight there. Makes me get all excited about the next few days or so. Well, you know, I... Uh, I, I work a lot with Archangel Metatron, and um, mm-hmm. you know he uh, and and I, I re- really don't think archangels have genders. I think we we give them all male identities, <laughs> but uh, I think they're just uh, incredible uh, energies. But um, Metatron says that uh, the new metaphysicians, the new light workers, uh, are going to be the science uh, the scientists, and I think uh, there was a reading. The case he gave where he said, and you might be able to correct me on this if I'm off, but I believe Casey said something to the effect, paraphrased, that people will come to understand more about or as much about the nature of Creator God through science as they will from religion. Yeah, he definitely sees that, yeah. So that's uh, that's really amazing stuff. So John, mm-hmm. we'll uh, end with you. Uh, just would like to. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a have, website I'd like to share with yes, you. Yes, JohnVanAuken.com. JohnVanAuken.com. I have a bunch of articles mm-hmm. on there, uh, based on Edgar Casey, mm-hmm. and they go into more depth on this material than we were able to cover. And uh, yeah, and I would just like to tell everyone uh, again. Uh, the importance of the ARE. They're they're a tremendous organization. And I've been uh, a metaphysical searcher since I had my spiritual awakening in Brazil in 1978. I had uh, uh, the opportunity in my life to circumnavigate the globe, but I was always a foreigner and I was always alone and usually uh, alone with my wife Anne. I should say we were alone. And uh, we were in language in countries where we didn't necessarily speak the language at first, and so uh, we studied metaphysics. I read uh, at one point every book that was in the ARE library, and it is a vast, <laughs> vast. That's collection. a lot. <laughs> well, you know, I was overseas thirty years, and I would come home yeah. once a year, and I'd buy a yeah. full suitcase full of books and, and cassette tapes, and that would be my uh-huh. supply. And television, when I lived in Africa and certain parts of, uh, you know, India, Russia, um, and uh, South America, where I lived for nine years, the television wasn't that interesting to me. So it was a setup mm-hmm. in retrospect that I probably planned for myself to enable yeah. me to study. Yeah, a uh, perfect and, setup. And, and yeah. Because, you know, uh, I, I, do, I speak four languages, but I had no choice. I, <laughs> you know, I, I had to learn them. <laughs> and uh, if I wanted to get from point A to point B, I had to be able That's to speak right. the language. And a lot of times, I had a back pocket dictionary. But uh, I studied, I studied Casey, but I also studied um, uh, the Carlos Castaneda, Castaneda works, oh, yeah. the Jane Roberts yeah. works, uh, the yeah. the just everything I could get my hands on, the Rosicrucians, and mm-hmm. and I got into the scientific aspects of uh, th- that I think I was led to because I did work as a scientist, as a geologist. But Mm -hmm. it is the Casey material. Of all of this material, it is the Casey energy that carries, in my opinion, the Christos energy. Uh, You know, you can get into metaphysics to the point where, in a a sense, it seems like a, a, a science. And but we always have to understand that the greatest science is the science of love, and it is yeah. Edgar Casey's work. When I read his material, when I listen to his, um, you know, to to uh, to CDs and cassettes by the people of the ARE, it is that energy that has that mm-hmm. Christos energy. And at this uh, this Easter weekend, it's an interesting uh, interesting time, and so. Yeah. So, John, thank you very much. Again, your, your website oh, thank you, is James. W, thank you, James. Your website is www.johnvanauken.com, uh, and the Edgar Casey site is edgarcasey.org, O-R-G. And so just to remind everyone, John will be our featured speaker at the Arizona Stargate event. I'm, uh, I consider John to be a mentor, and I uh, – 
his energy fills a room. I know he's probably, uh, he's very humble, and he's probably embarrassed with me saying this, but I think that John is one of uh, uh, of the two people that I admire most in metaphysics. He's one of my heroes, and I think that he is uh, so approachable, so down to earth, uh, and a vast resource of, resource of wisdom. You light up rooms when you come in, and so, John, I'm looking forward to seeing you again uh, okay. in about four weeks in uh, Arizona. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. my brother. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, John.